It's a good time of the year. Things are about to start up, but before that, we're going to wrap up this series. We've been going through the book of James all summer, and today I'm going to close out chapter four, and then we'll jump into five next week. But if you have your Bible, join me in James chapter four, and I'm going to begin in verse 13. James says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year, spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So before we explain that text and what he's talking about, it's worth just giving a refresher on the context of this book. If you remember, James is the half-brother of Jesus. He's fully man, not fully God, but he grew up in a household with the Son of God, with Jesus. And then he came to that saving faith and trusted in Christ when he saw Christ resurrected, became an apostle. And he writes this letter, we're told, to the dispersed Jewish Christians. We studied that in week one of this series. And if you know Jewish history, they were dispersed as a nation. There were occupying forces that came in, conquered the land, and as a consequence, Jews over centuries dispersed all throughout the Middle East and then getting further into the Mediterranean and and into Europe. Well, he's writing this letter to Jewish Christians that are dispersed. So the Jews had already dispersed, but then the gospel was dispersed. Do you remember Jesus told his disciples in Acts 1-8 that they would become his witnesses when they received power through the Holy Spirit? And he said this gospel message would start in Jerusalem, but it would go to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, the gospel did advance. The book of Acts tells us that. And it advanced into those dispersed regions where those Jews had settled. And many of those Jews heard about the resurrected Christ, and they surrendered their life to follow Follow him as Savior and Lord. And James is writing to them, and he gives an instruction here really to the businessmen and women amongst those dispersed Jewish Christians. And as he's speaking to them, he's talking about their mindset. Because during that first century, as a result and part of the Hellenization of the Mediterranean world, the world became smaller, it was more accessible, and there were these great port cities that were rising up, and business was booming. And it was common for folks to go travel to these different cities that were advantageous for their trade. They would go trade for a season, then move on to the next business opportunity. And he's writing this letter, and if you caught it, he's kind of rebuking that mindset. He's saying, you're making all these plans to travel and set up shop and sell your goods, then move on to the next one and make a profit. And he's going to rebuke that mindset, and you might ask, why? Because likewise today, there are businessmen and women listening to me, and they likewise, you in this room, have made decisions on where can you trade, where can you actually hold your business and make a profit. You might be asking, what's wrong with making plans for your business? And I will tell you, there's nothing inherently wrong with making plans for your business, but it's worth explaining a couple points. First of all, what James is not, James is not saying that making money is wrong. In fact, the Bible actually says quite the opposite. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, if a man does not work, he does not eat. We're actually expected to go get a job, to earn wages that are due to us so that God can meet our material, physical needs through that work and the wages that come from it. And likewise, what James is not saying is that making plans for your money is wrong. That's not what he's saying. In fact, if you remember Jesus with the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, remember how there was that story of this master who gave servants different amounts of money? And you remember the one guy that received the money and didn't have a plan for that money, he just buried it and did nothing with it. He's the one that got rebuked because God wants us to be good stewards with the time, talent, and treasure given to us. So making a plan for their money is not wrong. And likewise, I will tell you, James is not saying that having dreams and ambition is wrong. That is not wrong. I have dreams and ambition, things that I would love to see God do, and so do many of you. In fact, the Apostle Paul felt the same way. If you read Paul's letters closely, you'll notice many times he writes how he longs to go to certain places, that he wants to go see people, but then he has to stay for different reasons. So those are not the things, that's not the rebuke James has here. The question you might have once again is, well, then why is he getting on to these workers? Why is he saying it's wrong to make this big plan with their money and where they're going to travel and how long they're going to serve and then they're going to move somewhere else? What's so bad about that? 
The problem was they were making plans without consulting God. That was the problem. That they were actually being driven by their personal will without consulting the will of God. That they said, we're going to make these decisions. We're going to do what we want for how long we want, sell what we want, where we want. And then we're just going to go and do whatever we want afterwards. And James says that's antithetical to the Christian life. Because for Christians, we're actually called to depend on the Lord and counsel the Lord in all things because we're told the Lord is actually actively involved in our lives and he has plans for us. I'll read just a couple verses. One is Jeremiah chapter 29. This will be a familiar verse in verse 11. The prophet Jeremiah, the Lord speaks through him saying, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah says to Israel that God has great plans for Israel, plans for a future and a hope. And you might say, well, that was for Israel. And if you know the context, it was to Israel exiled in Babylon. And you're correct. But the same promise, the same message is communicated to the church in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We're told we are his workmanship, church. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, some of your translations will say planned, beforehand, that we should walk in them. So what the Bible says is God has a plan for my life. He has a plan for your life. He has a purpose. He's actually even lined up good works for us to walk in those. But the problem is sometimes we ignore his plan and we advance our own. And this is what James is getting on to them about. He's saying, you are making all these big plans without actually considering God and his plan for your life. And what James is saying is this first point, don't live independently from God. This is the rebuke. He says, don't live independently from God. And it's a good word for many of us because sometimes we have this mindset of, God, I depend on you for salvation. Yes, I need you to save me from hell. But now that that's done, I'm just going to take over and do what I want for the rest of my life until I meet you in heaven. And that is not gospel living. That's actually the opposite of surrender. We talked about this last week. When you make Christ the Lord of your life, you actually are surrendering your plans to his And you defer to his will for your life instead of your own. But this is not the way we think. In fact, usually what we think is much more like a secular mindset. Like, I've got three children and they are all dependent. They are not independent. They are dependents in my home. Uncle Sam agrees with me, so I get a tax break for them. But also, they are dependent in very functional ways. I pay everything for them. I provide a house for them, the clothing for them, the food for them. I give them counsel. There's rules and do's and don'ts. And they have to walk in that because they are dependent on me. But likewise, if I do my job well, one day they're going to become independent. Will they not? That's the goal. You don't want your kids always dependent on you. You want them to grow up and move out. That's how life works. And one day they leave and cleave and start their own home. They make their own decisions. They make their own money. And this is all good, and that is God's design for the world, that one day I will not be their instructor. Instead, I'll be a consultant called in when asked. Life changes. But the problem is, is God, our Heavenly Father, doesn't want us to treat Him the same way. Yet many of us do. We think we're independent from Him. I got this. I'll make these plans. I'll do what I want. And we call him in as a consultant during time of need. And God says that for us, spiritually, we're always dependent children. We always need God in our lives, and we always need him to speak and instruct and to lead and to guide and to help. And the problem is, for that first century audience, they had become independent creatures. They're saying, we're just going to do what we want, and we'll figure it out. We don't need God, but if you study God's word... All of the heroes of the faith show us how much we really do need him. In fact, I was thinking about different examples in the Bible, and there's a lot you could land on, but I'll just give a couple. The first is David. If you talk about David, he was a king. I imagine he had some big plans. He had a lot of drive and ambition, but notice what he prays. He sought the will of God in his life. In Psalm 143.10, he says, Teach me to do your will. For you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me onto level ground. 
David did not say to the Lord, well, now that you defeated Goliath, I got this for myself. I'll just do what I want. No, he said, Lord, teach me what is your will. Show me the ground you want me to walk on. Lord, lead me, guide me, protect me, instruct me. David understood he was dependent on his heavenly father. Likewise, Jesus sought the will of God the Father. In John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus, the Son of God, said, Lord, all I want to do is do what you want me to do. That's my will. My will is that your will will be done with my life. And how does Jesus tell us to pray? He actually tells us to pray to seek the will of God. We sang this earlier in a song a few minutes ago. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus says, Pray like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And then what's that next part? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says every single follower should emulate him in that we're called to seek and advance the will of God in our lives here on this earth. And you might be asking this question, why is this such a big deal? Why do I need to seek God's will instead of my own? James is going to give us two reasons right there in the passage. The first one is this, we don't know the future. Why should we seek God's will? I'll tell you the first one, it's pretty simple. It's because you don't know the future and neither do I. He tells us this in verse 14. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Sometimes we like to pretend that we know what tomorrow will bring. We read the Wall Street Journal, we look at the news, we make projections and forecasts. Can I just tell you, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. You don't. You might be highly intelligent, but you don't know it, and I don't know it either. I bet not a single person in this room would say, I saw COVID coming. I saw all that. That was going to happen. I totally knew it. I knew that was coming that next day. No, you did not. And if you live through something like that in your lifetime and you think you're still in control, wake up. Wake up. Because I've known a lot of people that think they know what tomorrow will bring, and then instead they go to a doctor's office in the best shape of their life, and they're told they're now fighting for their life. I've known people who have gone to work thinking they have all the job security and they're on top of the world only to be let go at the beginning of the day. I've known people that have received one phone call they weren't expecting that completely changed their lives. The truth is we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We're all just a bunch of weathermen making educated guesses with life. That's what we're doing. But the good news is there is one who knows what tomorrow will bring. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough worries for itself. Instead, we entrust tomorrow with the one who already knows what is to come. Why do we seek his will? It's because he knows the future and we do not. But then James says the second reason why you seek his will is because we are not in control. At the end of the day, we're not in control. Instead, how are we described? James said in verse 14, what is your life? What is my life? He says, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. He says, we are mist. I don't know if you're like me, but this morning I woke up and I had a cup of coffee or two, as I do pretty much every morning. And when you pour that coffee into that mug, what happens? There's a mist. Steam starts to come off that hot coffee, and it's there, and it's rising from the cup. But you know what happened within about five minutes? It was gone. It was gone. There was no more steam coming off of that. It had cooled. And what James is saying is my life and your life is like that. That we're here right now, but we won't be here forever. We're a mist. We're just passing through this world. And this is a hard reality for us to catch, that we're not in control. But there is a God who reigns from everlasting to everlasting. He's the Alpha and the Omega. But as for all of us on this earth, we're just passing through. This was illustrated to me very clearly one time when I was a youth pastor. 
And we held a disciple now at this church I was serving at, and there were hundreds of teenagers out there in the audience, and a speaker got up and gave a message, and I normally don't remember youth pastor, really any pastor messages. Truthfully, I've forgotten a lot of messages over the year, even as a pastor. But I remember what he said. Because what he said was he asked the crowd this question. He said, how many of y'all out there know the names of your great-grandparents? How many? And he said, when I say name, I don't mean Nana or Papa. I mean first name, last name, full name. And he said, not just one great-grandparent, but all of them. So if you have a traditional home, that would mean eight people. Your grandparents, parents. He said, how many of you right now can stand up and give me those names? The room went silent. Not a single person. He said, how about you leaders? How many of you could give all the names, full names, great-grandparents, any of you? Room is silent. And he says to the room, he says, what does that tell us? He said, you're the family. If anybody's going to remember the name, it's you. And you don't even remember it. And it was a good reminder to all of us that our names don't last forever. Instead, there's one name, God. And the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who reigns forever. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And James is saying, stop acting like you're going to reign forever. Instead, find rest in the one who will. He says, stop seeking your will because one day you will be done on this earth, but God's will and his kingdom will continue to advance. That's why for the Christian, we're invited to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. It's actually to advance the will and the kingdom of the God who reigns forever. He says, submit yourself to his will instead of trying to advance your own. That's why he says in verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and we will do this or that. He said, instead of acting like you're big time and you got all these plans that will absolutely happen and you're in full control, just acknowledge that you're not and simply say, these are some plans, but God's in control. And he's going to do what he wants to do. And I hope what I do is what he wants to do because I'm submitting to him and his purposes for my life. He says, change your mindset. And instead of making plans, submit to his plans for you and your life. And if that's you in this room and you're struggling with submitting to the will of God, I just want to encourage you with this point. God's plan is always the best plan. God's plan is always the best plan. Sometimes we think our plans are better. That's why we struggle to submit to God is because we think we're smarter than God. Can I just tell you, you're not. You're not smarter than God. You're not wiser. You don't know more. You don't know what's happened in the past and what will happen in the future. You don't understand the circumstances all around you. God's plans are always the best plans. And the Bible says if you're in Christ, he's for you, not against you. And his plans are the best plans. That's why it's best to submit in his plans. But I will warn you with this, just because his plans are the best plans doesn't mean it's going to be the easiest plan. In fact, I will go ahead and tell you this, sometimes the easiest plan is the wrong plan. I have found from my own Christian living experience, usually God's plans, oftentimes they're the hardest plans to actually do what he wants. This was illustrated to me a couple months ago. I went to the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting. This was in Indianapolis a couple months ago. And every year at that meeting, we commission international missionaries. Probably the best thing Baptists do is we put money together to fund international missionaries. We fund about 3,500 missionaries that right now are sharing Christ all around the world. And at this meeting, they marched up on stage 83 different adults of all ages, and they were coming on stage for us to pray for them as they were being commissioned to go share Christ wherever God was leading them. But what was amazing was of the 83 that stood up there, over half of them stood behind a screen. You couldn't see their faces. You only saw a shadow. And the reason why they did that was because this meeting was being simulcasted online. Millions of people would see it. And those missionaries were going to hostile territory. They were going to places that were where Christians were persecuted. And they were going to a place that if they knew they were coming to their place for that purpose, they would kill them or put them in jail. So they had to hide behind the screen to actually hide their identity for their own safety. And yet, even amidst all of that, can I tell you, I believe they were walking in God's will for their life. That sometimes God's will is not to do the easy thing, but it's to do the right thing. And the right thing is oftentimes the hard thing. 
And they are walking in God's will, yet they're about to walk into some tough territory. Likewise, I have seen for many that they might find that God's will is to actually fight for your marriage instead of fold. That's hard. It's much harder when it's God's will to discipline your children instead of just turn over. That's hard. It's hard to sometimes take a leap of faith and do something that you don't actually feel qualified to do. That's hard. It can be hard to speak up and share Christ in a world that rejects him, but it's hard and it's God's will. But even amidst all of that, God's plan is always the best plan because when we walk in obedience to God's will for our life, what we find is peace. Peace. I was thinking about this. I've illustrated with this once before a few years ago, but this umbrella here. In Austin, we don't have to use these very often, but we have lately, this summer. If you've been like me, you've had to open this thing up, and you've walked around with an umbrella. Now, when you have this umbrella, what's going on? You're walking in a storm. There's rain coming. And when I open up this umbrella and I walk outside, this umbrella does not stop the storm, does it? I'm still walking through it. It's still not that pleasant, but there's a peace and a security that comes when you're walking under this covering. And in the same way, when God calls us to walk in faith, he doesn't say that he's going to rescue you from all the storms. Jesus actually said the opposite in Matthew 7. He said, when the storms come. So as we walk in accordance to his will, we navigate through storms every single day. Storms in our health, storms in our homes, storms politically, everywhere we go. There's chaos all around us, yet what God has offered is his protection and his peace that surpasses all understanding. And how do you find that peace? It's by walking under his authority, walking in submission to his life, saying, Lord, have your will be done, not just today, but every day. And I trust you even when it's, not, even when it's hard. And what happens is you walk through these storms, but you walk with a peace that can only come through a relationship with Christ. But what happens for many of us, I've done it, you've done it as well, is sometimes we think, I don't need that umbrella. And instead, we just start doing our own thing. Start handling relationships our way. Start handling money our own way. Start handling our career our own way. Doing everything according to our will. And have you ever noticed what happens when you get away from his will and you walk in your will? You get pelted. Pelted. And I bet every single person in this room could testify to that. When you walked outside of God's will for your life, you got pelted by rain. And life was not easier. It was hard. It was difficult. There were consequences. That's why God in his love says, just stick with me. Just walk with me. And yes, it's not going to be easy, but there will be peace and there will be blessing from walking in obedience with God. So the question then is natural. How do I find his will? If this is where we all want to be, how do we find it? I'm going to take a few minutes to try to answer that question. How do you find the will of God? I'm going to give you four simple things, and none of this is groundbreaking. A lot of this is Christianity 101, but it's helpful information, and it's hard to live by. But today, if you're saying, how do I discover his will for my life? I'll tell you the first way to find it is this, through his word. How do you find his will for your life? You first have to start with his word. In Psalm 119, verse 105, we're told, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God actually navigates us. It helps guide us. It shows us true things and helps us recognize lies. The word of God leads us. It guides us. In the same way, in the New Testament, Paul tells Timothy, All scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. He says, for everything I have for you, for your plans, for your life, everything that you need to do it effectively is right here in this book. I'm going to give you everything that you need. That's what God tells us. And if you're seeking God's will, you have to start with this word. If you don't let the word be the foundation, you will start believing things are his word that are not. You will start confusing feelings over facts because you will feel things and think they're from God, but you actually have to test it from the word that came from him because sometimes, candidly, our feelings are wrong. 
And there are many people that think they walk in God's will, even though it's contradictory to his will that's been revealed to us in Scripture. That's why this has to be the foundation for your life, the authority and the guide. I've known people in my life. I've had a conversation one time with a man that tried to tell me that it was God's will for him to leave his wife for another woman because he sensed that God wanted him to be happy. That's what he sensed. And I told him, did you know that God's word actually has something to say on this topic? Have you consulted his word? He didn't like what the word says, so he said, no, God gave me a word. Can I tell you that's nonsense? Because the Holy Spirit will never tell you something that the Holy Spirit has already said is wrong. He won't say something's true that's going to contradict himself because, once again, God is the same. He doesn't change. But sometimes we think our feelings are from God. That's why the word has to be the authority, the foundation on which we stand. One time I knew somebody in church that came up to me, and he wanted me to make a decision to allow something in a church that went directly against policy and instructions that I had from my pastor at the time as an associate pastor. I was already told through clear policy that we don't do that. And he told me he really wanted me to do it, and he really sensed that God was leading us to do it. And he asked, will you at least pray about it? And I said, no. So I'm not praying about it. And he was like, well, why? You're a pastor. Boo, boo, boo. I'll tell you why. I said, because God's word already told me to submit under authority. And why would I go against that authority and go against God's directives that he's already given me? I'm not going to pray about something that God's already told me to do. In the same way, I've seen people that have stood up and spoken in different moments, sensing God gave them a word to share, but the words that came out were hurtful, full of selfishness, full of rage, and all it did was create division. You see, oftentimes we think these feelings in our mind or our heart are true, and the word of God tests those feelings and reveals facts. That's why if you want God's will, I have to tell you, you have to start looking to this book and then humbly submitting to what it says. The word of God is the foundation to finding God's will. But then secondly, how do you discover his will? You also go to his spirit, the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. We're told in John chapter 16, verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. This fall, I'm going to do a series on the Holy Spirit called The Helper, and we'll talk more about this idea and more. But what we're told is the Helper, the Holy Spirit, he helps guide us into truth. So as we're hearing truth, the Spirit confirms it in our hearts. And as we're seeking wisdom through prayer, the Spirit speaks to us. That as we pray, we go to God the Father through the mediation of God the Son and through the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit guides us. This is why a vibrant prayer life is so necessary. Because the Spirit will guide us. He'll compel us to speak at moments and He'll compel us to shut up at other moments. He'll compel us to take a leap of faith where we need to and He'll speak into our hearts. The Spirit is key to discovering God's will for your life. But then thirdly, we also need God's people. You need his word, you need the spirit, but you also need his people. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, we're told the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. What the Bible says is sometimes we struggle to find God's will. That's why we need God's people. That's why I will also tell you this morning that if you try to live a Christian life independent from a local church, you'll never be able to discover all of God's will for your life because God's designed us to live communally. That actually through Christian advisors, others that we live and do life with, God speaks into us through his people. And wise people surround themselves with godly people that speak truth into their lives while foolish people create echo chambers. They create people around them that will tell them the things they want to hear. And this happens in churches all the time where people will not commit to accountability, to wise counsel. Instead, they'll find the counsel they want to hear. And they'll find the advisors that will affirm whatever they want told to them. And instead, they find storms as a result of those actions. If you want God's will, you have to commit to his word. You have to lean on his spirit. You have to rope in his people. But then you also have to be sensitive to 
his circumstances. You have to be sensitive to his circumstances. I thought of this one verse. There's many I could go to, but I'll give you an example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to the church of Corinth. He wants to go see him, but the reason why he's not, he explains right here. He said, I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. And why? Because he said, a wide door for effective work is open to me, and there are many adversaries. Paul stayed in Ephesus for nearly three years, and he says, hey, I'd love to come pay a visit, and I'd love to go there and spend time with you. I love you all. I miss you. But he said, God has opened up a wide door, a door that's crystal clear. God's ministry was booming right there in Ephesus. Things were going great. And Paul realized, even though I want to be with you, I need to be here because circumstantially, God's made it so clear that this is where he's called me. And God does this in our lives. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes he opens up doors of opportunity for us where it's just so clear that that's what he has for us. And then the other way, God sometimes shuts doors and he closes them to say, no, that's not really where you need to go right now in this season. But once again, the problem is, can we submit to that direction? Because sometimes what also happens is God opens up a big door and we say, well, I don't like that door. I don't want to go do that. Even though that's clearly the need, even though your spirits lead me, even though people are counseling me, even though your word has told me, I'm not going to do it because I just don't like that door. And instead, what we try to do is we try to beat open doors that are closed, trying to manufacture our will on circumstances to try to create our will be done. And we get frustrated because we can't push an agenda of our own. This is why it's much wiser to look to those circumstances. And accept God's will in re that's being revealed to you through the word, through the spirit, through the people, and confirmed through circumstances. So he says, find the will. And I want to encourage you with this today. If you're trying to find God's will in your life, I want you to hear this. It's not mechanical, it's relational. I just gave you a few basic overviews of how do you go seek it. But at the end of the day, it's not formulaic. It comes through a healthy, vibrant relationship with God where these things all start to work together. And candidly, I will tell you, the hard part is not always seeking and finding God's will. Actually, that's not as hard as the last part. Because usually the problem is not that we can't find God's will. It's just that we don't want to do it. We just don't want to do it. <laughs> Like, we know what God wants us to do, and we just don't want to do it. That's why James speaks to that as we close our text in verse 16. He says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. For whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, he says, for him, it is sin. He said, sometimes we just become boastful instead. I'm in charge, I'll do what I want, and we lie to ourselves that I know better, I know what's best, even though God and others have made it clear this isn't right, I'm just going to keep doing what I want to do. And we boast in our arrogance, and we don't do the right thing that we know we should do. And did you catch what he said? He said, for those that don't do the right thing they know they should do, he said it's sin. In the Bible, there's two different categories for sin. There's sins of commission and sins of omission. Those are your theological words for today. Sins of commission are doing the things you're not supposed to do. That's what we all know. It's doing the thing that we know is wrong, but we do it anyway. That's a sin of commission. But a sin of omission is not doing the right thing we're supposed to do. It's, in other words, us pretending that we can be neutral. You know, well, I'm just going to kind of hang here and not do bad, but I'm also not going to do right. I'm just going to stay here and stay neutral. Can I tell you, there's no such thing as neutrality with God. <laughs> there's no such thing. When he tells us to do something, he actually expects us to do it. And he says it's sin to know the right thing to do and fail to do it. That's why I want to close with this question for you to ponder today. It's this. What is God telling you to do today? And notice I didn't say tomorrow, because tomorrow's not guaranteed, according to James. What is he telling you to do today? What's the door he's already opened up? What's the prayer he's already answered? What's the scripture he's already revealed? What is the message the Spirit has already convicted you in your heart of? What's the thing you're already supposed to do, but failing to do in this moment? James says, do it, because tomorrow's not guaranteed. For some of you, maybe it's to start a process of reconciliation with someone where there's a lot of bitterness, a lot 
of unforgiveness, but God's put that on your heart to forgive and to reconcile. For others, maybe it's investing into your home. Maybe it's to create time and start running your calendar instead of letting your calendar run you. For others, maybe it's literally ending a toxic relationship with a boyfriend or girlfriend and finding God's best instead of settling for your own will. For others, it might be something like serving in the church. Instead of hearing about all these great mission trips and opportunities, actually going for yourself and growing in your faith instead of hearing about everybody else's growth. For some in this room, maybe it's to speak up and share Christ where God has made it clear and the person's right there and the door's open and you're convicted and you just won't do it. And maybe he's saying, speak up. For others, maybe it's shut up. Maybe God's saying, don't talk. You've been talking too much lately. Just listen to people. Just be quiet for a season and let those relationships be restored by not even saying a word. God tells us to do things, but the question is, will we say yes? One of the first people I ever evangelized to, one of the first people I shared Christ with, I was 17 years old. I got serious about the Lord during that season, and I went on a trip to New York on a chapel choir tour of all things, back when we used to do things like that. And I went to New York, and I was 17, and there was a young adult there in this park, and I felt led to talk to him. And I didn't even really know how to talk to him or what to say, but I just felt compelled to say it. So I went and talked to him for a few minutes, and I started sharing my testimony, and I asked him, do you know Christ? And he said, well, I've, I've been in church. I know all about your church and yada, yada. I said, yeah, I know, but do you have a relationship with God? Like, do you have a personal relationship? And he looked at me again, and he said, well, no. I said, okay, well, would you like one? And he said, no, not right now. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, right now I'm just young. I'm going to kind of do what I want to do. And he said, maybe I'll get to that later. And I heard that answer as a 17-year-old, and I just looked at him, and I said, how do you know there's going to be a later? I said, like, how do you know you'll have a chance to do what's right? How do you know that? And he kind of looked at me, and he's like, well, I guess I, I don't know. But you know what, he ha what happened after that? He left. He left. He didn't do what's right. And see, this is the point of decision. It's like you can know what's right or you can actually do it. Those are two different things. It's one thing to know about it. It's another thing to actually do it. And what James is saying is stop knowing what's right. Start doing what's right. Start actually doing what God puts on your heart and start walking in obedience to his will. Even though it's not easy, there will be peace and there will be blessing that comes from obeying him and walking according to the path that he's laid out for you. But he says, don't just know the right thing to do, actually do it. So I ask again today, what is the thing God wants you to do today? Because James says, tomorrow is not guaranteed. 